distancing and salmonella. Can, every, can you hear me? Perfect, okay. So uh, Kaylee is passionate about rats and I'm passionate about diarrhea. So we, all, we, we each have our, uh, our thing. And so I will, today I'm gonna to talk to you about um, a, a project that we're embarking on on whole genome sequencing of salmonella and trinidis with a lot of different partners in this room today. Um, so many of you have heard of salmonella entritidis, but I'll just give a brief introduction. It is, uh, it, causes, it causes diarrhea, and salmonella entritidis, or SE, is a specific serovar or strain of salmonella. Um, it is a zoonosis, um, and it causes, it's probably one of the, it is the most prevalent serovar of salmonella in British Columbia. And here in BC, we've been having a problem with salmonella entritidis for the last 10 years, and there's been a five-fold increase in the rates of salmonella entritidis um, that haven't been attributed to one specific cause. So we call it an, an ongoing 10-year outbreak, but there's really no specific cause. Um, we have substantially higher rates of SE in BC compared to other um, and to other provinces, and we have about 12.6 cases per 100,000 people. And we know that this is a vast underrepresentation of the actual number of cases. There's probably, for every case that is reported and diag well, this diagnosed, diagnosed using lab tools, there's probably 25 cases that go undiagnosed. Um, in British Columbia, all salmonella cases are interviewed by the regional health authorities. Um, and one of the biggest challenges with doing an investigation of this ongoing SC issue is that 80% of people will report having consumed chicken and eggs, and the most likely source of salmonella and trinidis is chicken and eggs. And so this makes the um, possibility of doing epidemiological linkages as well as traceback very, very difficult. So let's start with um, going through a case investigation. Um, We'll start with little Jimmy. Jimmy has a stomach ache. He's had diarrhea for a couple of days. His mom takes him to the doctor, um, and he, uh, he submits a stool for a culture, and two days later, it comes back positive for, for salmonella. Um, so that sample would be forwarded to us from the frontline labs to the BCCDC for, for their subtyping, and so that's sort of just business as usual. But things become really interesting when another seven cases present linked in space and time uh, as, and being diagnosed with salmonella as well. And so what goes on next? Well, the, all these cases would be interviewed by public health. And in this situation, seven people will have, uh, seven out of eight will have reported consuming chicken, and six out of eight reported consuming eggs. So again, there's no clear linkage of what was the cause of these cases. And so at the lab, we used to do a tool called um, pulse field gel electrophoresis. And this is a DNA fingerprinting tool. And it, was, um, so wide, it is so widely, um, it's so widely accepted as the enteric subtyping tool that's actually a network of labs across Canada, the US, and Europe uh, called PulseNet that actually ensures that all, all different labs doing this technique are doing them in a similar manner. And it's a mechanism to compare the different profiles Across, the, um, across Canada and across different jurisdiction. Well, what we see here is, uh, I don't know if you can see, it's, it's very small, but everyone has the identical pattern. So really it does not provide any information about whether it's the chicken or the eggs, or maybe some sort of other exposure. Um, so let's go, so in some, let's go through another scenario where in some sort of miracle world, you actually have leftover food, which this never happens in an outbreak, um, and you have an isolate from the chicken and the isolate from eggs. Again, never even happens for eggs. Eggs are always negative. Um, and so again, all of these cases have, so the case, all the cases plus the two different food exposures have an identical pattern. So does this suggest that it's both the chicken or the eggs? Anyone have any guesses? Well. The problem is, is that this pattern here is pretty much in all human cases and a lot of the environmental cases that we look at. PFGE just isn't a tool that works particularly well for salmonella and trinidis. It's considered clonal. So what we see out there in clinical cases and in food samples is pretty much an identical pattern. And PFGE provides pretty much no information in terms of being able to link cases to one another or link food to a case. And so from that perspective, it's really been demonstrated that for this pathogen, Pulse field gel electrophoresis, our sort of gold standard for typing for enteric pathogens, is not, it's not suitable, it's not useful. It doesn't provide the resolution that's needed to be able to, um, to for our outbreak investigations. But there is a very promising tool out there called whole genome sequencing. And this is um, a new emerging tool that has really been, been forced to the forefront of uh, clinical medicine and is thought for, at least in the foodborne outbreak investigations, to revolutionize the way we do our investigations. And it's because it has the sufficient resolution to link highly clonal cases to one another, 
and to, and to contaminated food sources. And it's for this reason that our colleagues down in the US, with the CDC and the FDA, use this as the primary tool to do seminal outbreak investigations. And Public Health England has gone rid of all um, traditional typing tools uh, for enterics and replaced it with whole genome sequencing. So as I mentioned, it's, um, this is a very promising tool. It has been uh, promised to revolutionize and, mo and modernize um, diagnostic medicine. And it's thought to have the additional benefit of not just providing DNA fingerprinting, but also be able to provide all sorts of other insights in terms of the phenotype and the genotype of that pathogen. So it actually can replace old traditional tools. And so that's why Patrick Tang, some of you know Patrick Tang, he used to always put up this, um, this comment that whole genome sequencing is, promises to be the one test to rule them all. And so instead of having to do test upon test upon test upon test with a single um, whole genome sequencing run, you can, determine the, you can determine a lot of different features that you couldn't have done before. So you can, you can diagnose, you can confirm, you can genotype, and now you can even look for things like virulence factors. So you can really do it all. Of course, there's a lot of um, growing pains in terms of operationalizing this routinely, and it's not, one of the challenges with it is that it's very technically challenging, and it's, it is more expensive than routine tests. Um, so let me show you an example of how whole genome sequencing was used in an outbreak investigation. Recently, there was a national outbreak of Salmonella brandirup. So brandirup is another serovar of Salmonella. And here I've just presented the BC cases, and I, I'm sorry if you can't see, if it, this slide doesn't have that much resolution. Um, for you guys in the audience, but what I really wanted to point out here is we have eight cases here. Um, there's seven clinical and one food sample. And here we have what we call a clustering or a phylogenetic tree. Um, and this shows the genetic relatedness amongst the different isolates. And we're using a tool, a bioinformatics tool called Whole Genome Multi Locus Sequence Typings, or WGMLST. And, and up here, again, you probably can't see it, but it, there's a scale. And it shows you the number of differences at different alleles or different genes in the genome. And it shows that in this case here, when we look at these eight cases, there's over 180 differences amongst these cases. So this is showing that there's some outliers or there's some strains in there that are not related to one another. And if you look at this, the tree itself, you'll see that this case here is very unrelated. So it's at the 180 plus alleles par portion. And likewise, these clusters here, they are separating quite differently than these ones here. So what we can do is remove these cases um, and regenerate the tree in a matter of seconds, and we can see that we went from having 180 different alleles difference amongst these different cases, or 180 genes different, down to having less than three. And so when there's a difference of only three alleles amongst different cases, we would say that they're, we're very confident to say they're highly related. So we say these three clinical cases are related to one another, they're clustering together, and they're highly linked to this environmental sample, this food sample. And so this is the way that whole genome sequencing can be used to um, assist in outbreak investigation. And of course, it's always coupled with the epidemiological interviews and traceback that really puts, puts the whole outbreak investigation together. So it's just one of many tools, but it has that resolution that's really helpful in outbreak, outbreaks where before with PFG, it would have, we wouldn't have been able to cluster these so tightly. Um, so this is um, what's happening with uh, Salmonella here in British Columbia with um, the clinical cases. Um, all Salmonella in BC are being sequenced routinely since May 2017, and actually they're being sequenced across the country. So we have whole genome sequencing being, being done in close to real time, about a four week lag time, um, so that it can assist in these outbreak investigations. And so we're sequencing, or our, us plus our colleagues at the National Microbiology Lab, are sequencing thousands of isolates, and this is an example of a tree with over 100 isolates in it, and it's not uncommon to see these massive trees because there's just so many Salmonella enteritidis cases, and so this is way more difficult than doing a brown drip investigation where you only have a handful of cases. You have so many cases that are reporting similar exposures. What you can see um, is that they are clustering into separate groups, and we see, we see three different subclusters, as well as a handful of sort of outliers that aren't really clustering together in the middle there. And so this looks like a single cluster, and we're you know, going to look at whether or not they, we're going to look at that in more detail to see when we remove these additional cases, do they still cluster together? And what happens when you do put the, when you do take out all the outliers, it makes the resolution higher for your phylogenetic tree. And what we can see here is that even though the epi evidence suggested that perhaps they were linked based on their exposure and, and in space and time, that genetically there are two distinct subclusters here. There's subcluster one and subcluster two. Um, and there's one case here that even though, again, from the epi interview, it seems like they'd be, they would be related. In fact, they, 
um, they were not related genetically. They're quite distantly um, um, related. And so here, if you, you can't see the scale up there, but these cases are all within five genes of one another. Um, and the other thing that's really interesting is that the two su different subclusters are about 10 genes apart. And what this suggests is that there's a common ancestor. So that, this means that the two, different, the two different pathogens evolved separately, but going back to their, a con their, they go back to a common source. And so that could be some really interesting information to look at from a food production perspective. But unfortunately, we don't have whole genome sequencing for food happening routinely. And so that's really why we wanted to launch a project to be able to demonstrate the utility of doing whole genome sequencing from farm to fork to start to understand what the environmental exposures are, what's happening on the farm, what's happening in food, and how does it relate to what's happening clinically. And so that's why we're working on a whole genome sequencing pilot from farm to fork, really to demonstrate whether or not this is a useful tool. And so um, this, can't, this farm to fork study cannot be done with a lot of partners. And so I wanted to mention just where, where the different isolates are coming from for this study. So um, all um, salmonella cases in British Columbia, um, the isolates are forwarded to BCCDC for further subtyping. So we are the contributors of the human samples. Uh, there are also um, different food programs that are going on that are contributing samples to the study. So um, we run a very small um, salmonella surveillance program at our lab um, called the Food Quality Check. Some of you who are EHOs will be aware of our salmonella project. Um, and then there's also two national programs, SIPARS um, and FoodNet, that also conduct retail food sampling in British Columbia. So they've provided their samples as well. Um, and then from the farm perspective, FoodNet and SIPARS are also collecting farm samples, but the vast majority of samples have been supplied by, um, by the Animal Health Lab. Um, and so uh, here, at the B here for the BC Ministry of Agriculture. So these are all the different partners in terms of the supplying of the isolates, but we can't do this work without actually having the context of what these isolates mean. Just building a phylogenetic tree without having the epi data or the metadata from why those animal samples were collected or, why, or what the clinical exposures were, there's no meaning to, this, to building this phylogenetic tree. And so we really are reliant on our partners um, at BCCDC and environmental health and epidemiology, the epidemiologists at the Ministry of Health, as well as the regional health authorities to supply the information to be able to contextualize the genomic data. So in terms of the study period, um, we, it's a retrospective study. and. One of the things about seminal enteritis is it usually doesn't cause defined outbreaks, as far as we're aware, because um, the epi data is not strong enough to be able to actually cluster people into different um, outbreaks. But in 2016, there was an exception where there was actually six clusters that were epidemiologi epidemiologically well-defined. So we chose this to be our retrospective study period, um, and these outbreaks occurred between May, or sorry, March and August of 2016. So we're also looking at the animal and food data from that associated time, but we're actually looking back all the way to January to account for the lag between food production and clinical cases. Um, so over the study period, we have across British Columbia 445 clinical isolates and about 260 uh, food and environmental isolates. So about just over 700 isolates will be sequenced in this project. And our sequencing is ongoing. We're about halfway through the sequencing. Um, so I don't, at this point, I'm just sharing with you the study design, and I'm hoping that next year, I will be able to share with you uh, the outcomes of the study and where maybe the phase two of study. And so why are we doing this study, and why is it important to do this one health farm to fork approach for, for um, salmonella enteritidis specifically? And there's many reasons. We want to understand why is it that we've had such an increase in salmonella enteritidis in this province? Um, what is it? Is it one type of salmonella throughout the whole province? Well, we see clinically there actually is a quite a bit of diversity. We want to know if it's being locally acquired from locally produced food or maybe is nationally distributed food. And is there something about our environment specifically that's causing salmonella enteritidis to have emerged at such a rate um, compared to other provinces? So more specifically, what we're trying to understand is, is there a similar diversity that we see in humans that we also see in food and the environment? Are there some strains that we see in humans that we don't see in the, in the BC food production environment. And likewise, are there some strains that we see in predominantly on farms that don't seem to cause clinical Ill illness? Perhaps they're avirulent. We don't know that information right now. So we're hoping to gather that sort of basic understanding of what's happening in terms of salmonella enteritidis here in BC. Um, we, of course, want to then make those linkages to be able to say whether or not any of the 
food strains are, for example, related to the clinical strains. But more importantly, we really want to build that collaborative nature to do one health invest whole genome sequencing. So it's, not, so it's a little bit less about the data, but about the process of bringing people together to being able to share isolates, to share methods, and to do, the, um, to do the analysis together. So a lot of the tools, for example, that we would use in agriculture would be similar to what we would do in humans. And so being able to share the laboratory methods as well as the um, bioinformatic analysis as well to be able to really be able to leverage that work and move it forward in terms of that one health whole genome sequencing approach. And lastly, we want to see how this data could apply to, um, to supporting the BC government's um, initiative to reduce the burden of salmonella in BC by, oh, I don't know if it's 2023, does that sound familiar to people? Um, and so we want to understand how whole genome sequencing, identifying where the, what is the source of the SE can be used to reduce the burden of salmonella by identifying um, interventions that are based on evidence. Um, and so with that, I just wanted to share with you the basics, the, what, what our plan is for this perspective, for this retrospective research project. And our goal is to be able to do this prospectively, to apply it in real time so that we can look at those exposures and then follow up in real time as opposed to waiting two years later and under, trying to understand what happened um, during those clusters. Um, and so I really just want to acknowledge this is, um, a, a large team effort. There's many people contributing to this project um, and really want to emphasize the contributions of someone, um, she's not here today, but Kim McDonald. She, um, is, she works at BCCDC, but she's actually a Public Health Agency of Canada employee. And she's really been instrumental in helping develop this program, but also being able to evaluate and validate the bioinformatic tools. Um, and also wanted to mention the support that we received for this project. We have funding from Ministry of Health, Ministry of Agriculture, and the BCCDC Foundation and would welcome any questions. Wonderful, thank you, Natalie. Questions? Come on, there's gotta be a few out there. Okay, I have one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you mentioned that um, the differences in alleles, you said three, is there a specific threshold that you, that you identify as being to make that association? Yeah, so on, for clinical cases, um, as well as for some of the foodborne outbreak investigations to date, we've um, set a threshold for salmonella enteritis of 10 alleles. Um, and so generally, based on, there's been a lot of sequencing for salmonella enteritis um, clinically, and a lot of foodborne outbreak investigations, and that seems to sort of be a good cutoff point. That seems to be supported by all the other lines of evidence. Um, for other salmonella strains, you might go a higher or lower, depending on the specific situation, but it, um, the, the strict cutoff doesn't necessarily apply to other zero bars. Yeah. No other questions? Okay, thanks, Natalie. So, so our final